center of a vast, successful empire, it became home to an extraordinary flourishing of all kinds of culture. For this is the time described by 1001 Nights of great and generous caliphs, magic carpets, great journeys, but also ambitious buildings, music, dance, storytellers, and the arts. <laughs> Baghdad was such a cultured and vibrant city that one traveler of the time wrote, there is none more learned than their scholars, more cogent than their theologians, more poetic than their poets, or more reckless than their rakes. It really must have felt like Baghdad and the Arabic empire with the world leaders in civilization and culture. To be part of that city's growing intellectual elite must have been as exciting as it gets. It was a new Muslim city. It only started to be built in 756. So it has that sort of sense of almost being on a, on a frontier, of being something new, of being something different. Um, it was full of courtiers, it was full of um, sort of nouveau riche individuals who were trying to make their way at the Abbasid court. And it is the sort of a place, if you like, where innovation is valued and appreciated. At the heart of the city's intellectual life was a system called the Mejlis. Now the word Mejlis could probably best be translated as salon or talking house. In 9th century Baghdad, what this meant was that the city's elite, the caliph, his courtiers, generals, and the aristocracy, would hold regular meetings, you might call them seminars or discussions, during which the city's cleverest men, the philosophers, theologians, astronomers, and logicians, would gather to discuss and debate their ideas. It was not the case that people were expected to adhere to a particular line or adopt a particular religion. They were allowed to express their own sentiments and their own views very freely. The point was that they should do so in elegant Arabic and a good logical reasoning. The effect of the Majlis was to create a heady mix of money and brains, with the best minds in the empire swapping ideas while simultaneously engaged in fierce competition for patronage. It's at this point my investigation into the first wave of Islamic science returns me to the man we first met at the beginning of this story in the back streets of Cairo, the great mathematician who brought the West the decimal system. Out of the very heart of this intellectual whirlwind came Al Khawarizmi, mathematician, astronomer, courtier, and favorite of the Caliph al Ma'mun, who was a product of his age, an emigre from eastern Persia into Baghdad, surrounded by books, well versed in learning from Greece, Persia, India, and China, and fearless in his thinking. Al Khawarizmi brought together two very different mathematical traditions and synthesized them into something new. The capacity to have on your desk simultaneously two very different kinds of mathematics presses on models of what counts as calculation, what counts as measurement, and I think accelerates the, the process of intellectual change. The first of these traditions came from the Greek-speaking world. Greek mathematics dealt mainly with geometry, the science of shapes like triangles, circles and polygons, and how to calculate area and volume. The other great mathematical tradition al Khwarizmi inherited came from India. They'd invented the ten-symbol decimal system, which made calculating much simpler. Thanks to the translation movement, al Khwarizmi was in the astonishingly lucky position of having access to both Greek and Indian mathematical traditions. 
he was able to combine geometrical intuition with arithmetic precision, Greek pictures and Indian symbols, inspiring a new form of mathematical thinking that today we call algebra. As a physicist, I've spent much of my life doing algebra, and I can't overstate its importance in science. But it is a strange idea. I remember being perplexed when my math teacher first started talking about mathematics not using numbers, but with symbols like X and Y. It's an incredibly liberating idea because it allows you to solve problems without getting bogged down in messy numerical calculations. So we have here this priceless manuscript, Kitab al-Kharizmi, al-Kharizmi's book. And Professor Ian Stewart has studied algebra for much of his working life. Together, we looked at an early copy of the book in which the idea really took form. I see here, although it's written sort of in the margin, the title of the book, uh, al Jabr wal Muqabala. So that's the first time the word al Jabr appears. Algebra. algebra. That's where our word algebra comes from. Now, what I found very early on is that he said, I, I, I discovered that people require three kinds of numbers. Um, Judur wa amwal wa adad. So roots, squares and numbers. So what is he trying to do here? This is what we would now call x and x squared. These are quadratic equations. This really is algebra. So he's setting you up for a book about how to solve equations by algebraic methods. OK, now quadratic equations, I thought, were around and being solved long before Khwarezmi, back to Babylonian time. So you know, what's the big deal about this book? It's the point of view. He treats root and square.